Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Joya Maguchi. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Japanese American National Museum. And as we get started, I just wanted to give a few notes. Um, first, thank you so much for joining us today for this exciting program in collaboration with Janum, MOCA, Made by Us and for Freedoms. Um, we're really excited about um, the group of folks that we have gathered today. In addition, um, if you have any questions for our panelists, please use our Q&A feature at the bottom of Zoom. Um, you can find that in the toolbar, and then you can also leave them in the chat if you'd like. If you have any technical questions, please also use the Zoom chat to ask those and we can help you out. Um, please note this program will run for about an hour and be mostly in English with the optional audience participation through questions. And this program is also being recorded. So um, with that, I want to pass it over to the president and CEO of Janum, Ann Burroughs, to um, start us off with some introductory remarks. Thank you, Joy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm so glad that we can all be together. Even though we're gathering virtually, um, I feel that it's important for me to acknowledge Janam's presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva people who experienced brutal discrimination and dispossession at the hands of European settlers and colonizers. The Janam campus is recognized as a site of conscience because it was the place where Japanese Americans gathered when they were forcibly removed from the West Coast and incarcerated in American concentration camps during World War II. But it remains the ancestral land of the Tongva. And we pay our respects to the Tongva people. And we're deeply grateful that they remain the traditional caretakers of the land on which Janum resides. At Janum, because our core stories center on the injustice of the past, forced removal, the dispossession, and the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. We're deeply committed to using the lessons of history to shine a light on the injustice, the discrimination, and the divisiveness of the present in order to shape a future that is, that is more just. And from the very beginning, we've used art to challenge historic orthodoxy and to recontextualize Japanese American history. Art and culture have always been at the heart of how we've tried to build community, to build trust, to enhance the appreciation of cultural traditions and diversity, and to encourage wider community participation and tolerance, all of which are hallmarks of healthy civic engagement. And at this moment of great reckoning with structural racism in, in America, the increased bigotry and the rise of anti-Asian sentiment, our hope is that we can continue to inspire and motivate people. And the hope is that they will engage more deeply with our democracy and more deeply and meaningfully in their communities. And of course, one way to do that is to vote. So if you haven't already done that, Please, you have, until this off, until, you have until Tuesday, November the 3rd, to vote. And now it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce you to you, my friend, my colleague, and my neighbor, Klaus Biesenbach, who's the director of MOCA. Over to you, Klaus, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Such a wonderful introduction. And as we are neighbors and friends, we were just uh, celebrating the town halls uh, end of February, beginning of March, two weeks before we went into the lockdown. So I'm very honored and grateful that we are working on this together with Janem. So a huge thank you with Janem and a thank you to Made by Us, to the MOCA team who worked on this um, preparing this panel, and of course to For Freedom, so we, who has been such an incredible partner during these times for many museums, for many initiatives, and also bringing joy often to days where you nearly couldn't find it. 
So we will have an incredible group of speakers who will be introduced very shortly. And it's about the role of the artist and the role of the artist as a creative agent for change. Creative agent for change as an artist, but we can also all vote, so please vote. And it's my incredible pleasure to introduce uh, Caroline Klibanov, who is the program manager of Made by Us. And Made by Us is engaging the public by um, bringing history into civic participation. And this is such an incredibly important um, activity, this engagement you're doing. You have historical connection and future thinking. So I'm very honored to introduce you, Caroline, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great honor to be here today and to be here with such wonderful panelists. Uh, my video has been stopped, but there we go. Okay, uh, it's my, it is still my great honor to be here today uh, with these wonderful panelists that I will introduce to you. Um, just a little background, thank you for the introduction. My name is Caroline, I am with Made by Us and we are bringing together the nation's history, museums, historic sites of all kinds, all shapes and sizes to better engage Gen Z and millennials with history as a tool for civic engagement. Uh, we're headed towards the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 2026, and we're bringing institutions and young people with us along the way. So looking forward to um, diving into this conversation, which, which is so relevant to the work that we do. And we are delighted to partner with Janum as part of Made by Us as well. So our panelists today are really just an amazing group of, of artists and thinkers about art and democracy. So um, I'm pleased to introduce three of our speakers. We have Glenn Kaino, who is a conceptual artist whose works aim to reconcile conflicting ideologies, opposing systems, and strict dichotomies in material and exper experiential ways. And we'll get into some of his specific uh, work in a minute. We are here with Claudia Pena, the executive director of Four Freedoms, which is an artist-led platform for civic engagement. She's on the faculty at the UCLA School of Law in the Gender Studies Department and the Prison Education Program. And she is a member and staff of the Guild of Future Architects. Christina Wong is a performance artist, comedian, writer, and elected representative whose work explores how race and gender play out in America today through humor and satire. It is just great to be here with you all, um, despite all of the circumstances that we're all in. Mm -hmm. Art is yep. so critical to not only getting out the vote, but to sustaining a vibrant democracy, because it's never going to be enough to have a democracy on paper. It's something we have to live out every day. Mm -hmm. And all of your work in different ways helps us navigate that. So we're gonna get into some questions here. My first question is, have you voted? Yes, I voted yesterday and I'm trying to prolong the use of my adhesive by, because uh, I want to be able to tell everyone every day instead of wearing the same shirt. Nice. Oh, well, that's smart, but no one would see the back of my laptop, Glenn. Yeah, exactly. right. Anyway, this is my nice. hack. You can steal this if Wonderful. you want, folks. Love it. I, but you know what? I saw you, um, and I have a little bit of regret that I stuck it on the computer. I was like, I should have just pinned it onto my shirt. Well, just pin your computer to your shirt. <laughs> Problem solved. Problem Good. solved. Had to make, had to make sure. <laughs> so beyond imploring people to vote, which we're seeing a lot of these days, you know, I feel a little inundated, although it's a good thing. What do you feel are the most effective ways of driving people to civic participation through your practice? And we'll start with you, Glenn. Um, uh, well, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's really exciting to be on the panel with, with all y'all and, and uh, uh, you know, really great, especially in this, in this uh, moment in timing, what a crucial, critical time um, that we are all in. Um, look, I think that for, for me, um, I've always uh, aspired for the work to operate and engage with the public in a number of different ways, you know, and, and you know, generating 
Um, my studio, the way I work is everything is sort of generated from the art practice, but oftentimes the ideas that are inspired, you know, you know, from sometimes more rigorous um, and challenging uh, thought processes in the context of art find their way out into the cultural uh, sphere in different ways, you know, in, in different pop cultural moments or, you know, um, moments here and there. And so whether that is through film or, you know, through um, protests or different ways, you know, it, it's, oftentimes it starts and, and there's a direct correlation and relationship between the space for thinking that I fundamentally believe that art has the power um, to, to help generate for people. Um, but, but knowing that not necessarily is always the institution or gallery, the, the best means to convert that thinking into actionable sort of, um, you know, sort of civic participation, right? And so, you know, in between coming up with an idea in a studio with the intention of it being engaged in a gallery some way or um, landing with the uh, uh, action, you know, in, in sort of helping contribute to, you know, the social fabric. So there's a lot of steps that have a myriad of different ways. And I know that the, uh, my other two panels are, are fantastic examples of that as well, you know, and so, but for me, it's really about understanding where we start with a, with a lens toward where we want to go. And then you just, you know, the, the art process is not only what make what happens here, it's the meandering through all the different s systems, whether the civic pop culture or whatnot that get you, you know, to a place where we're engaging in multiple publics, you know, with the idea of inspiring and, and sort of contributing. So. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into talking about, you know, the role of institutions there too. Christina, Claudia, what would you add? What, if, what, how can you drive people to civic participation and voting through the work that you do? Uh, well, you want to, you want to jump in, Claudia? I can, I can answer this. I, so I, I am an elected official, everybody. Bow down. Uh, 72 votes, if you count the vote I cast for myself. I am, I am the Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council Subdistrict 5 rep. Big deal, very big deal, folks. And and it literally was outside the rec center where their our polling site was like um, using my Korean passing face to uh, lure uh, hominies into the uh, <laughs> voting space to, part, to vote for me. So that's like how I literally got like physically kind of with this charm and this face got folks to vote for me. But um, I will say beyond that, the reason why I ran was because I was feeling like we were in a place a few years ago after the last election where as an artist and clown lady and comedian, it was like, it didn't seem like I used to be the one who made spectacle and now artists or sorry, politicians are the one making spectacle. And I wasn't sure how to subvert that anymore. Like, like me being crazy, they weren't the straight men anymore. They're like the wacky ones and we're the straight man, you know, in, in this comedy formula. And I was like, wow, it's like now we're the ones who are creating um, quiet and change and reflection. And they're the ones who are just creating the spectacle. So why don't I just run for office? If they're going to take my job from me, I'll take theirs from the them and report from that place. So I can tell you as someone who does both artists, is both an artist and a politician that culture moves faster than legislation. Mm -hmm. um, legislation moves only because of the shifts in culture. Uh, if you look, the, the best example I can give is, is the, the vote to legalize gay marriage is like, that could have only come after just a lot of uh, a cultural like image of LGBT folks being normal, being you know influential in this world. And like, why did, what was the point of denying those folks the right to marry and whoever they love, right? Um, so, so that those kind of shifts in culture helped shift, you know, the mindset of folks around that population, and and I think shifted that vote in their favor. So, uh, or our our favor, and and um, yeah. So I do feel like culture needs to push first, and uh, legislation ideally follows, but it's. It, I, it also does feel like as an artist that being a politician is like being a sculptor with some really dry, 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 boring clay. Um, there's a lot in common, I think, that politicians and artists have. And I can go that's into that. Fascinating. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Um, Claudia, when I think about, you know, what Christina just said and the way that art is kind of turning things, you know, on their head for people because there's not only politicians and artists, but there's the role of citizen too that you all also um, share. 
Four Freedoms has so quickly become this nationwide engine for public art that challenges us, but it also welcomes us into that conversation, much like I think humor might do as well. Um, and I actually have one of your pieces right by my house on the Human Rights Commission, the uh, in DC, the Hank Willis Thomas pieces, there's two there. So it strikes me that the work you all show is so balanced between inviting people in, but keeping them on their toes. It's accessible, but there's a responsibility there as well. So how, how, how does that work you know, to encourage voters to participate? What is the goal of Four Freedoms there um, in getting people to look into their own responsibility? Thank you, Caroline, for that question. And thanks for having me here on this panel today. I want to answer the question fully. So I think one of the things that Four Freedoms is doing is we want to encourage civic participation, clearly. But we also want to be honest about why people haven't been civically engaging. Right? Mm -hmm. We want to acknowledge the history of disenfranchisement that this nation has forced upon many of its vulnerable communities. And we also want to be clear that electoral politics isn't the end all be all for many of the groups that we're in community with. They're really interested in addressing systems of oppression like sexism, transphobia, racism, um, violence against women, et cetera. And for a lot of these communities, voting for people that they feel very uninspired by, very unmoved by, it's not exciting to civically engage in that way and to vote. And so we want to make it clear that civic engagement is necessary, but not sufficient. It's something that people must do, but it's not where it's not all of the eggs in the basket. There's also grassroots organizing, uh, engagement around your own creative expression as an artist. There's also whatever needs to be happening in your own neighborhoods, in your own families, conversations that need to take place. If you put all of that together with voting, if you're eligible to vote, then it becomes a picture that people become much more comfortable with imagining a future with. But if electoral politics is all we have to offer, that can be very uninspiring, right? So when we imagine how people might receive this work, it's that we want to push things forward clearly. We want evolution of our society, evolution of humanity happening at all times. And if you uh, are willing to evolve and adapt, you can't get comfortable. Right? So that's why the keeping on your toes part we can never get too comfortable and um, just sort of stop growing because that's when you start dying. So good. And it reminds me of what Christina was saying about the face, bringing people in. It does matter. It can't just be dry electoral politics all day mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. What, um, in thinking about that, how can art and cultural institutions learn from the work that you all do to better serve our democratic goals? Christina, we'll start with you. What do you think our institutions, you know, the role that they serve now and what role do you think they could serve better? Now is a tricky time, right? Because we can't go into a gallery to experience mm. work. We can't go into a theater to experience work. Um, a lot of cultural institutions are just trying to figure out what to do because they're paying rent on empty buildings that we can't gather in. Um, a lot of them are furloughing employees or just straight up laying folks off, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I think uh, they're, they're, they still provide a platform. They still have a subscriber base. I'm trying to just think how to, <laughs> to describe it. The way organizations have been helping me lately in my work is I run a sewing group called the Auntie Sewing Squad. So a group called art to action offered to be our fiscal receiver so that we could receive donations, not just not, but I don't like having random money Venmo to me, but it was making me a little bit nervous after a while. I was like, I, I, I think we need to kind of do this semi more legitly. Um, but basically our group um, donates uh, masks to vulnerable communities who don't have access to masks. And we've also been in relief drives to places like Standing Rock and the Navajo Nation. So um, institutions have been helpful in uh, helping just amplify that work, um, if they have any resources left at this point or to give to, you know, uh, to, to offer, uh, shout us out on the mailing list or shout us out on their social media, th those things have been helpful. But yeah, I, I will say the whole system has shifted because of the condition of, you know, we can't actually physically use spaces. Yeah, and you've had to shift, I mean, your work to, to online as well. Oh, completely. Oh, yeah. So this is my house, BTW. I tore a show about running for office. That's why it looks like I'm running a 
Fourth of July parade in my house is <laughs> I had to adapt this to my to my house, but like that's you know, and I was very lucky that some of the organizations that that have some infrastructure were able to step in and help present it, even though I actually didn't step into their space. Definitely, um, Glenn, yeah. you've exhibited your work in so many major institutions. What's a role that you see these institutions can play? You know, in being a civic space and and not just talking about the past, but talking about what's happening right now. I think it's interesting because I think that artists are going to, by nature of dynamic practices, have um, are going to be more nimble, obviously, than the institutions. Though, you know, um, I am on on several institutional I get boards, so to speak, and and I know that internally, um, a lot of institutions are trying to actually you know, make changes and keep up. But you know, I think it's important to recognize and understand that the historic function and role of these types of institutions that have shaped not only their entire organizational design or about stewardship of the canon, you know, oftentimes from a primarily con colonial perspective, right? So we're, we're dealing with sources of agency and, and, you know, notions of institutional validation that have been set up to fundamentally, fundamentally be in opposition to dynamic change, right? Like the role of these, particularly collecting institutions instead of the Kunstall have been to like save stuff so that future generations will understand what's important, right? Which is why, you know, when that collides with the art market, you get into deaccessioning conversations, but when it applies to politics, you know, really what I find that the most interesting things that people are doing, we're, we're all basically versions of like hacking the system, right? Because mm -hmm. what we know is that the institutions provide things like institutional validation and credibility and what that leads to from an investor okay. perspective or supporter or a collector, some type of thing, because we know that there are resources involved that are needed for activists to do their work. So you hack the system, you engage with an institution to try to create and generate some type of validation for radical, essentially radical ideas that art allows to, to incubate and to exist, right? Some ideas that we might have, if you just walk down the street without you know, the context of art, people say, you're fucking crazy. Oops, excuse me, it's never gonna happen. But in art, anything is possible. So the best you know, work I see are work of artists who are hacking the system to try to use these formerly and currently colonial infrastructure in order to uh, you know, adjust, modify, manipulate, to then create a new context for which work to then create and generate it. And I think that it's almost like the escape velocity of some of that work when it goes into the public sphere has different levels of engagement because right now we're also teaching the public through good and bad means what art means, you know, through gross conversations in the public about the market and how art works with like collectible things, but also, you know, from street art, there's, there are, are several um, subjective moments in different worlds of art that we're, 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 you know, through layering of time, like educating our audience what art means and what art can do. And, and um, you know, I'll, I'll toss it over uh, uh, because, because I think that, you know, to Claudia, because what I think, what I really love about For Freedoms and, and, you know, Hank, Michelle, Claudia, everyone's doing there is, it's almost like not only are they hacking the system, but they've created an alternative infrastructural model to, to run alongside of it in between a conventional political space and a conventional artistic space. I know in my nonprofit work, starting up nonprofit galleries, and you know, again, with the work I do in institutions, we have had a similar mindset, but, but you know, For Freedoms is like a really great pirate ship sitting in between a museum and a, and a yes. political pack. And you know, it, what's great about that is it allows a myriad of artists who don't have those institutional relationships per se to go in there and have and create access points in, in, in really wonderful ways. And, and I think that is, you know, a, a very novel and sort of super powerful way for us to unlock powers of generative creativity, you know, in some of these more mainstream uh, moments. So. Thanks. Tell us more, Claudia. How do you do it? I'm like, Glenn, you're hired. Come on. <laughs> Not me. I want a job. I want a job. Okay. Also, everybody. <laughs> I, I want to say that for cultural institutions, the low hanging fruit in thinking about themselves as civic spaces is the easy stuff host town halls, become a polling location, mm -hmm. um, have mm -hmm. informational you know, meetings. We're currently working with a GOTV firm that's uh, providing trainings for some of our cultural institutional partners so that they become experts on voting rights in their jurisdictions and they can share that with their patrons, et cetera. That's low hanging fruit. I feel like that should be sort of the minimum because cultural institutions are civic spaces. The bigger thing, 
at which the uprisings of this year have sort of forced everybody to do is to look in the mirror and look at complicity, right? There's a lot of complicity on behalf of cultural mm -hmm. institutions in holding up these structures and systems of power that have caused harm in our society here in the United States and on a global scale for a long time. And some of that complicity is in looking at hiring. What does your staff look like? Who are they representing? Um, pay structures, right? Uh, I think that cultural institutions in the art space in general is a very underpaid in really crazy ways, a really underpaid industry. When I, I saw a spreadsheet that showed salaries across the board, and it's, it's, a, it's a norm. It's not like there's only some cultural institutions that are paying their people this way. It's a norm and it's outrageous. So much of it is below the living wage. How does that exist? How can that exist? How can people be storytellers and promote storytellers, truth speakers, um, and be, be, be paid below a living wage? That doesn't make any sense. And then mm -hmm. also, you know, um, with, the, with the types of art or the types of cultural productions that are promoted over others, sometimes that's because um, you know, speaking truth to power is a little bit uncomfortable for folks and they don't want to have anything to do with that. So there's just a lot of, you know, looking in the mirror that needs to happen too, um, in order to do the good work of addressing all of these things that ill our society. Yeah, well said. I, I can say I wish that was the low hanging fruit to just become a polling place. I think many, many institutions yeah. are not there yet. Um, and part of what we do through Made by Us is we're bringing together the ones that want to become civic spaces, that want to reach young people, that want to work collaboratively, which is also, you know, not um, not traditionally been the way things are done, to to do that better. But I can tell you, you know, we're at the start of a big shift. I think. So I wanted to get to something that's just so cool, Glenn. Can you please tell me about these headphones? that I have seen because I wanted to add, you know, I'm all about the history, got to bring the history in, but all of your work invokes history in such interesting ways. And I just, you have to tell us all about these headphones. Uh, well, I, first of all, I'm not getting paid. So uh, I will say that if I talk about them, it's uh, just so everyone knows, not a plug. Um, no, I've been working for, for many years with uh, African-American activists, athlete named Tommy Smith, who in 1968 um, did the salute uh, mm. after the, won the men's 200 in, in Mexico City. And um, I will plug, however, that our film is released on Monday night on Stars at 9 p.m. Uh, mm. So please uh, go watch that. And um, we, we uh, my partner, uh, filmmaker named Afshin Shahidi and myself, um, along with John Legend, Jesse Williams, and Mike Jackson, Tysa Glorious, we put together a film about my work with Tommy and really telling Tommy's story. And, um, you know, the, the story about um, us getting together was really about, you know, understanding that history. Um, you'll, 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 I won't tell you a story that you can see uh, on Monday night. But um, effectively, what, what the effort has been over the past 10 years almost is to connect a, a, a story from the past, a symbol from the past, you know, with the movements of the present. And, and that's been really exciting to watch. And, you know, one, one big moment and aha moment of, of the production was when Tommy uh, began to articulate for the first time for me what he meant or intended for that gesture, which everyone has since interpreted as black power. And of course, from him subjectively as a black male, it was, uh, but his intention always in him, every time he spoke about it, he always said human rights. He always meant for that symbol to me to be actually uh, a, a un unification gesture, something that brought us all together uh, in different ways. And um, and so we made this artwork that had him in this middle, middle with the word unite and then um, Due to a number of different amazing circumstances, things that we did in the film, and we got to go meet. You know, um, I, I brought him to go meet President Barack Obama. We got to, you know, hang out with Colin Kaepernick a bit. But also, uh, one of the things is we were able to um, generate a pair of headphones with the Unite. Oh, um, uh, cool! Um, and this on the side. And if you, ah! I, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're uh, a basketball fan, but but uh, they wore them in the bubble, and LeBron James wore them three times. Um, and I will say that uh, just in, this is like the only time I'll say it's a secret. There's only 50 of us on the call, so 58 of us. So so this is like a top secret. But in the one side, it says like Tommy Smith official, which is because it's officially Tommy's like helped me design them. But the other side, it says Glen Kind of Studio. And if you notice the oh. L, I, I uh, is an italics L because it's Lakers. Um, so so I'm just saying. 
I'm not taking credit for the championship. I'm just saying every other player who had the headphones and the opposing teams also put on a Lakers L in their ear did happen. So, so uh, it's happened. So anyways, no, but I, that's a perfect example, I guess, from how something started with an artwork in a, in a museum, you know, we, we started that project that, that secured us route. The main project was a, a sculpture made out of 200 of Tommy's cast arms. And it started out at Expo Chicago with a small grant. It moved to Studio Museum of Harlem. It then was in a uh, exhibition called Five by Five over at Washington DC with uh, Los Angeles Nomadic Division. Um, it then went to the High Museum of Atlanta. It then went to the San Jose Museum of Art. And then, in my, then after that, it ends up on a Beats headphones in the NBA Finals. And so to me, that's sort of a circuitous path about how, you know, one way that um, an intersectional alliance can manifest in, in a unification gesture that really just started out with me and Michael Rooks at the High Museum talking about, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could do a show together in many years and, you know, um, uh, ending up uh, with, with a, a cool piece of uh, swag that uh, get up later, so. Very cool. It's a great use of, you know, if you are a fan of history and the story of this, you know, famous photo and action, you can come at it that way. If you don't know anything but the last 10 years of, you know, action, civic action that people have been taking, you can come at the history. Um, if you're just a fan of basketball, um, then it sounds like you can get in that way as well. It's just a really like there's so many entry points to that. Um, Claudia, what do you think, you know, how can voters today take inspiration from the past and channel it into civic action? Good question. And Glenn, they owe you a ring. I really think the Lakers should give you a ring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm gonna make that request. <laughs> at, at the Guild of Future Architects, we've been talking a lot about this quote by Zora Neale Hurston. Um, it says, uh, the present was an egg laid by the past that had the future in uh, um, again, the, the present was an egg laid by the past that had the future inside its shell. And it's just, it's a recognition that all of this is all of it at the same time, right? So mm. part of thinking about history, I think is coming, um, is having a reckoning also, um, coming, coming to a place where we recognize and acknowledge the role that has been played by the state, um, and has impacted people's ability to be able to engage. And somehow there should be amends made. You know, this is where the role of reparations um, takes, takes sort of, it should take precedence over all the other things that we're talking about. Because when you don't make amends, when you don't repair, when you don't offer reparations, how can there be any real healing? And people need healing in order to be able to participate. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm thinking about when I think about the history. I think about the history of harm mm -hmm. and our ability to heal now and that it's all sort of intertwined in the same sort of space. That's fascinating. Someone's asking if you can repeat the quote for our viewers. I can, and it's by Zora Neale Hurston, who I hope everyone has a chance to read if you want healing mm -hmm. in your life. And the quote is, the present was an egg laid by the past that had the future inside its shell. Oh, One of the other things we often say is um, imagine the past and remember the future. Yeah. Yeah, and it speaks to your point, you know, if the past is full of harm and, you know, things that were done to hurt people, how can you, what's, what's inside the egg really? Like what can you expect there to be? Um, it's really interesting, you know, there's ways into thinking about the past and our present civic duty as um, citizens through literature, as you said, through basketball, um, through music in your headphones, and of course, through comedy. So Christina, I would love to get your take in 2020 of all years. I mean, because your work deals with really serious themes, but it does so through comedy and satire and humor and what is less funny than 2020, you know? So how can you help us uh, as voters navigate this using your tools? I had, uh, so I've been working on this kind of new lecture that I do about how we ended up in this moment, which references what I referred to earlier. We used to listen to politicians and laugh at comedians. Now we laugh at uh, politicians and listen to comedians. And I can basically, with my obsessive non-PhD knowledge of reality television, trace you through um, 
early Jerry Springer from the Roddy King beating to reality TV to how we ended up um, in the situation now where uh, we're, we're basically what comedians used to do, which is be the, the wacky one, doesn't make sense anymore. And so what I have found, uh, which is actually more suited to how to my nature as a dark and brooding, serious artist, is um, is that the tools for comedians right now is to embrace um the the quiet of it the seriousness of it and to to sit inside the emotional core of it and not be afraid of that um to recognize that the stage has literally shifted that the stage is not necessarily a stand up club I, I mean for some time i think comedy has been moving out of the stand up arena into theaters into galleries I've, i'm seeing i'm 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 sort of reflecting too as someone who's been presented and who tends to not get presented by these traditional comedy settings and more these art settings and um i i think this is a moment for for those who make work whether it's comedic or not to to think about uh our role as holding a different space up to what doesn't exist in real life and that space is earnestness and like I think that unfortunately and weirdly enough I don't know if it's unfortunate but like that is actually the radical space that we have to hold on to at this point is 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 earnestness so I think about like Dave Chappelle's eight minutes I think 43 seconds it was um it, it, he, he did an outdoor commentary about about the the, the time of the, the George Floyd um was just dying on the street and it's not hysterical or extremely funny but here's someone who's known very much as a comedian holding the space reflecting on George Floyd's murder and um and I think that's very profound that uh, and when I watch late night comedians I feel like I get a better take on the news than from newscasters right that, that they actually lay it out so I I I can't teach you really quickly how that's done but I do think that this is where we're at is that things have flipped and now it's on the job of the comedians to be the earnest and serious. And this is not, doesn't mean like drain yourself of all, all humor you see, but I think sit in that realness and then kind of pull from those moments that are amusing or absurd. Um, but that to me is that, that is what I see as the yeah. revolutionary role we do. That makes a lot of sense when you think about, you know, politics, generally speaking today, can be so devoid of the humanity, the human side of things. Mm -hmm. And for a comedian, there's so much, it's all about, to me, as a, as a consumer, certainly not a comedian myself, it's all <laughs> about the connection that I get with other humans and the shared common human experience. And that just seems to be missing from so much mm -hmm. of um, the machinery that, that we see. So I wanted to, by the way, if you are watching and you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A and we will get to those shortly. Um, I wanted to ask you all actually, as we think about the role of the artist in not only encouraging individual voters or civic participation, but building movements. Um, and both of, all of you have spoken a bit at, about this already, but as you think about building movements, how do we build beautiful and powerful movements and what is the role of the artist in supporting those wider communities of change? You know, you have your work, but how does that ripple out? And anyone is welcome to, to start. I'd love to jump in uh, and talking about the Auntie Sewing Squad. My like, <laughs> just became my life in the last seven months. Um, so at the top of the pandemic, we saw that there was a need or like it was just me actually at that point, but I didn't I didn't create this group yet. Um, but that that frontline workers needed masks, and there were no masks. And uh, and even Joanne's, my uh, my most despised craft store in the world, wasn't prepared for the homesteading movement that was making homemade masks. Like they were out of elastic, they were out of cotton, they were clothes, they're only doing drop off, and then they were canceling orders. Joanne's. Anyway, um, so. Uh, I I created this group called Auntie Sewing Squad and I was so flustered because I had was just getting hundreds of requests and I was saying yes to all of them because I'm going to say no to someone who thinks who's afraid they're going to die, especially if they're a nurse or someone volunteering in a homeless shelter or whatever. And uh, I didn't even realize that the acronym for Auntie Sewing Squad was ASS. Like that's how like fast I was working here, you know? And, and, um, 
and I just began to like literally pull anyone who I remembered who could sew and people would join and I somehow became the hub like because I was getting all these donations and we couldn't make this problem go away with money it was it was a sort of flip on capitalism in that it was labor. Like whoever still remembered how to sew from home ec was the most valuable person. You could throw a thousand bucks at me and it wouldn't make the mask come out any faster, right? Like it, this was about a certain heart and labor. And and so, uh, so you know, I have my mom like pulling her friends out of retirement um, to sew for the first time in years. And, and, and kids, I have them cutting for me. I like all, every child labor joke came true in this situation and I was like everyone's going to revolt and kill me this is this is crazy this is not sustainable so we created this whole system of care within our group where I said to folks like we're we as aunties are as susceptible to this virus as the rest of you and if you want to if we're going to be accountable to the health of this community you need to send us a pizza you need to bake us cookies like if you're going to be making this sourdough bread and posting photos of it while I am hungry and menstruating through my pants for two days because I'm so fucking exhausted that I can't take care of the, oh, it's being recorded, isn't it? Okay. Anyway. So, you know, like, <laughs> you know, then, then help us. Right. And, and that care system mm -hmm. has been what has sustained us. And it's something that doesn't exist in a business model. You know, in a business model, it's like you get a bunch of workers, you pay them as little as possible to sew as much as possible. Then you send them back out in the world to survive with what you paid them. And, and we had to find a way uh, to, to re recognize that our currency was not cash. Our currency was fabric and elastic and our time and our care, our hands and our hearts. And, and, and we had to do a lot of education around that to folks asking us for masks who, who've become so Amazon Prime to believe that you just shoot whatever and we can just, right. you know, it's invisible. So, so to me, that is the flip was, was, was thinking about how I think about things as an artist when I work in communities that sometimes things don't financially make sense with a creative project, but the output, uh, there's a reason why the group needs to be structured a specific way, which doesn't make financial you know, numbers sense, but sustains something greater and longer about our community health, right? And our emotional health. Yeah, and it may not even make, you know, artistic sense. Yeah, I wanna hear about your thoughts, Claudia. Thank you. Thinking a couple of things. So one, um, at Four Freedoms, we believe that everyone's an artist. Mm -hmm. People just haven't tapped into the potential. Um, some people have deadened the potential uh, through experiences of trauma or whatever else has happened in their life. But we believe everyone's an artist. Second, we don't believe in being prescriptive towards artists. So I don't think that an, any artist must have any particular role. Like I don't impose that on anybody. And also Paul Robeson taught us that artists are the radical voices of civilization. And so to the extent that artists, is, artists want to be involved in social movements of any sort, it is the very serious very serious truth telling um, that artists play as storytellers. There's a lot of a lot of studies that show that when you're trying to change hearts and minds, maybe when you're trying to get people to vote for particular ballot initiatives in a state like California, or um, just sort of in general, that people don't care about statistics, they don't care about graphs, they don't care about white papers, they care about stories. And the people mm -hmm. who are the best ones to tell those stories are artists. And the reason for this is because artists still use their imagination. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some people have, uh, for many, for a whole myriad of reasons, some people have stopped imagining. And so artists are the mm. only ones left holding the bag of imagining that future that Arundhati Roy could hear breathing, right? And so they're the ones that can visual help bring that to fruition, visualize that, manifest that. And then everybody else can turn and say, oh, we can have that, that can exist. It doesn't have to be this way. And that's what I see happening um, right now with the, with the social movement of the wide awakes that's happening mm -hmm. not just all over this country, but there are chapters all over the world. It's artists that are taking it upon themselves to say, listen, we don't have to live this way. This is the way that things could be. And they're making all sorts of art to ensure that this is not just um, an idea. It's not just a draft. It's not a proposal. This is a reality if people choose it. They're muted. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you know, in the studio, I, we say that imagination is a perishable skill. You know, you have to use it mm. 
remember how to use it. And I think that, you know, one role of the artist is to, is to obviously inspire and to do that. But, you know, also when it comes to movement, it's very interesting to me to think about that because uh, again, and get back to four freedoms and, and the, the work of the collective, you know, part of movement making implies multiple people and part of that, you know, which is incongruous with the nature of what I think the romantic notion of an artist is, is like my own ideas. And one thing that I, I, I am, um, very clear to do because I do a lot of collaborations and a lot of partnerships as well, you know, is that there's a time to, to, to express yourself and there's a time to, to team up and collaborate, you know, and a time to share, you know, and I think that, you know, as we, the, the, the problem of heterogeneity is that it's heterogeneous, <laughs> you know, people have different thoughts, people have different concerns and people like uh, fear, you know, and pain and harm are universal. We all feel them, we feel them in subjective ways, but our needs are also very different. And so one might be creating moments of expression from one's own fr you know, framework and subjective framework. But you know, I think part of movement making is aligning the intent and sort of the interests of where you find shared space to go then create momentum that is greater than greater than yourself. And you know, while I while I while I think that, you know. Hopefully in my career, I will create works that maybe, you know, I have thought of, but, you know, also I'm very proud and, and, and to be more of part of bigger projects that I, I played a role in. Uh, and, and so I think that's part of what I think that, that I try to do in, in, in our studio, but I, I, you know, again, for, for Four Freedoms and, you know, other, other organ wide awakes, other organizing principles that allow a shared space to be created by building, you know, for better or worse, the use of the word platform to build connective tissue that allows these moments of even ephemeral alignment, that, that that's when movements can be made, you know, in these spheres of individualized imagination, so. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it really makes me think of this program we just did through Made By Us, which I'm sorry to plug, but since Janum's one of our partners, I feel okay about it. Um, but since anyone can participate in this, uh, we, we build this website called mywishforus.com um, and you can go and share your vision for America's future. And it's all about just opening the door to an imaginative process, starting to picture that world that you want to live in so that then you can mm -hmm. take the steps to build it. Um, Cause without that imagination piece, we're not even, we're, that's the first step. So, and you can actually tweet your local representative right from the site. You can share your wish with them. So and you can explore wishes all across the country, even from historical voices. We have one from Paul Robeson. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. But on that note, actually, we have a good, great question from someone who is watching. And it reminds me um, of the steps that we can take beyond voting and beyond election day. So Evan has asked, in terms of movement building and sustaining and not focusing on the election as the be all end all, what would each of your calls to action be for artists' work after next Tuesday or after Inauguration Day? I'll start with you, Claudia. With me, have fun. If you're ready. But, sure. Um, what would be the call to action for artists' work after Election Day or Inauguration Day? Got it. Um, okay, so one thing that I would say is that every artist has something that they've been kind of thinking about uh, marinating on that they think I can't do that or or even more fun I don't want to do that <laughs> why does that keep coming to my head I don't want to do that it's too hard it's too scary it's not my lane that's like ugh, that one makes me so mad it's not my lane everything is your lane um, yeah I would love for every artist to think about what that one thing is it's been scaring them because now's the time. There's mm. never been a time awesome. where we needed you more. That is awesome. I did, never thought about it that way. You know, I thought, oh, pick up trash and be a good neighbor after the election. <laughs> this is why we need to hear from, from the three of you. Christina, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I, one thing I, my show, Christina Wong for Public Office, which will be airing at the Center yeah. Theater Group website starting tomorrow plug. Um, but one thing I talk about is that we all have the power to make symbols until they become real life as politicians and as artists, mm. right? That, that we create these worlds that we want to see happen and we just will it to happen or we're making it happen in that moment. And um, as a neighborhood council, I led the vote for Koreatown to vote to support the ab abolishment of ICE, 
right? Um, unfortunately, it was a symbolic vote because as it turns out, I can't take it out of a federal agency from neighborhood council. However, it's like, it was a hugely symbolic emotional moment and it, it took a stand, it, it set the needle to say, this is an immigrant neighborhood that's gonna take a stand for all immigrants. And I, I, I think um, I see this happening in other parts of government that, that they, they, they pass things to chastise or praise or whatever. And we have a statue of Liberty. It's a symbol that says we welcome folks, but we're not actually legally obligated to do it apparently, you know, when we when we look at what our treatment of immigrants is and what that statue says, but it's important to have these symbols out there. But I think right now there's, I think there's a lot of people who keep talking about this future, right? That they can't wait to get to where they can get in the theater. And I wanna say to those artists, like, listen, I didn't wanna do my show in my house, but I was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna wait two years to, to do it. So, so it's, it's work, it's labor, it's, but, but for all of these artists who, um, and I'm one of them who for years, like you, you've kind of been thrown the scraps, you show up to a venue to play and like, oh, it's a cafeteria with no lighting. Okay, uh, five people have showed up. Okay, the budget is what, zero? You know, you've been training for this moment of making something happen with nothing because that's what we're literally working with. There is no bar for Zoom theater. There's no, I'm, maybe there's a bar slowly happening because we've been in this for seven months, but like we are in this moment of great exploration and this need to connect. And I, I, I say just, just try to just imagine your work just having an impact in the world. Like my ensemble theater is the auntie sewing squad right now. Right. We're not doing shows, but we're, we, we are, we are like a political presence right now, which wasn't even what we started to be. We were just going to be a two week sewing stop gap, but you know, right now we, uh, we, we have a platform we're building. And we're trying to get folks out to vote. I'm so inspired right now. I just, that was such a good campaign speech. First of all, thank Although you. Um, it's rehearsed. No, it's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, like just the thought of, you know, working with what you have, working with right now. Glenn, would you add anything to that? You know, as you are clearly seize, seize the moment, you know, to develop work that responds to things that are happening. Um, what would you add to that? I think that uh, I just to not give up. I mean, I think it's resonating with what Claudia and Christina both said. I think that one... I try to have our studio be in a constant state of motion where we're always um, making a thing, we're always opening a thing, but we're always researching and imagining and, and kind of, you know, um, hoping for, for, for something to happen as well. And there's, we're, we're, we're always in this constant cycle of, of motion pushing forward. And, uh, you know, it's been, obviously 2020 has been exhausting, you know, and so it's, it's hard enough you know, as Christina, you said, it's like, it's almost like you, you do the work as an artist to go then do the work, you know, you go, you I go, know. you go, fight, go get the venue, you get to the venue. And then you just find out that the venue just made it that time, that hard, that much harder for you to succeed, you know? And, and I think that one, one thing that I found particularly in this moment, and I, I'm, I'm, um, you know, uh, uh, interested in is, uh, people, a lot of people have been uh, dispirited, you know, by, by the moment and lack of resources. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging moment, challenging proposition. And, and a lot of the times I, I, I think that people question, you know, I think this resonates with what uh, uh, both Claudia and Christina said as well, um, is the question, the value of art in that way. And I think that there's no small symbol, you know, to, to Christina's point and, you know, what Claudia said. And I think that uh, everything, like you never know that one person who saw that vote, who is then inspired, who has a different worldview, who has a different set of circumstances, mm -hmm. who ends up inspiring someone else, and the causal reaction, you know, of of of, of symbol making, of image making, you know, of idea making, you know, have have long term great repercussions, and it's all sort of it's all a movement in that way. Um, and, and artists are the ones that are going to imagine the new, you know, utopic visions of things. And, and, and you know, if not, if not us, who, you know, because certainly, mm -hmm. you know, people who are more constrained with less imaginative worldviews are not out there, you know, defying conventional logic to figure out how systems can be better. No one cares more than you care, um, than we care. Yeah. Uh, partly because if it's self-interest, also, they don't care about us. Um, so, so, um, you know, it's just important to keep on keep on trying, keep on making work after um, but the job's not done. <laughs> you know, right. Even if we get the job done on Tuesday, which we're going to 
sweep. Uh, then after that, the, the job's not done because then the job, then, the work really begins. You know. um, yeah, the work's been going on also. You know, it's yeah. it, we're all part of the story. When made by us, we always say, you have a role to play in writing the next chapter. And, it, and it's true. Um, just to close out, we have just five minutes left. Um, each of you, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. When you're doing this public work and work for the public, how do you navigate the gap between you know, what the public is facing and what they're dealing with and your personal politics or personal identity? Um, is there even a line anymore, really? Um, or has there ever been one? And you know, what would you say to artists that are, that are hoping to navigate that in this very fraught climate? I, I'm trying to understand the question. Are you saying how do we communicate with folks who just have very different belief systems than us, or, think, or is that? I think you know it's one thing to be someone that works for political for a personal political view, and you can channel your art that way. But when you're doing public art, does that change? When you're serving the public, does it need to change, or are you communicating your personal politics regardless? I mean, for me, the, the question, I mean, the, the follow-up question to you back is, I mean, there's different levels of engagement, right? And so, you know, in the, in the, in the instances where, you know, we are creating projects that manifest in the public sphere that with the intent, concern, and intention to you know, generate support for ideas that we have about the way the world should be more inclusive or, 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 or whatever, you know, th then in that case, you are asserting you know, energy around a belief system that you're putting forth to the public. You know, I guess when I hear the word public art, it's a little cringy only because that's it implies to me also a secondary system that sort of like commissions to make work in the public. Yeah. Different boundaries. And I would actually be curious to hear it for Claudia, because I know that I just do a couple of four freedoms things, you know, and you go do a thing and then it's like, well, you know, because we're a, you know, government organization and we're bound by certain different rules or even, Janum, the, the, the nonprofit stuff, you know, and, and, and having been the steward of some of these, you know, that's where it gets tricky in terms of what's the politics look like, where's the money coming from, and that complication is, a, is an additional wrinkle um, that, I, that I'm interested in as well, so. I, I feel like art is so inherently personal that it must be honest, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine, especially at Four Freedoms, um, mm -hmm. ever being in a position where we encourage or we ourselves have any sort of practice of placating or dumbing something down or making something softer because it's gonna be seen by any particular person or because it's been funded in a particular way. I just, I can't imagine it. I don't encourage it. If, if you're not gonna make something that is 100% honest or authentic, then move on to a different project. Yeah, yeah well said. And you may know in the museum field we have a saying, museums are not neutral. There's no, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no such thing. So yeah, this is great. Um, well, we're almost out of time. Any final thoughts you're burning to, to leave our, our audience with before we go? Vote, <laughs> vote, run for office, show up at meetings. Like for me, I would observe meetings. I'm like, they're Drop, Christina. <laughs> yeah. It's our opportunity to really grow our muscles of resilience. It's not the first time our civilization has been in this situation where we feel like everything around us is burning, literally burning in Southern California, mm -hmm. and everything is going to hell in a handbasket. And yet humanity has survived and evolved and, ad and adapted. So um, have heart. Resilience is exactly what we need right now. And also, Glenn already called it. He created a reality for all of us. There's going to be a sweep. The world's going to be so much better as of Tuesday. There we go. That's it. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you for Janum. Thank you to Mocha. Thank you to Four Freedoms. Thank you, Christina, Claudia, and Glenn. And thank you to all of our 
participants and audience members today for your questions. <laughs>